So let's move to Lottie's question. Um, her approach, uh, thank you by the way, Linda, that is great. Uh, her approach to, <laughs> did you clap? <laughs> did you clap? <laughs> Her approach to collaboration and fluid interactions of photography in everyday lends an insightful approach to considering access, representation and identity relating to our question of is photography democratic. Weavers are often invited to take part in your work with all the conversations around image fatigue and all our lives being oversaturated with by images. How, if at all, do you think power can be derived from being seen by others and seeing yourself reflected on screen? It's a big question. <laughs> uh, I think, first of all, I want to say um, I don't consider myself a photographer. I'm, not, I'm, I'm an artist. Um, I work across, uh, I mean, like quite large scale video installations where like, you're in basically in a giant pop video. Um, I also make multi-screen work. I'm very concerned with the internet. Um, I think it's really important. I was really, really pleased that you mentioned um, access because uh, really, you know, we're talking about like the developed world, you know, who have, has access to these telephones in the pockets. Um, particularly, I think with my practice, uh, I come out of a background of club culture. I kind of like fell into throwing these big parties, um, kind of in a group. Um, I was very, very interested in simply just observing the group dynamics. Uh, everything from, you know, who was the first, I don't know, who someone's having a crush on to like who, what trains people are wearing, to like what drinks they want, to like the way that they behave on like the Facebook group. I, I totally kind of really, really kind of creepy voyeurism. Um, that then <laughs> moved into um, my artwork. So as you're describing this work I did called Dance Therapy, which is, was a way, well, no, let's go back in between. Visibility. Now, in the years that I did Maxilla, we uh, made, I made prints, I made print my courses, I made prints, I made posters, and I made fanzines. The massive preoccupation was about getting people in groups to come and meet up in real life and what popular culture meant, um, because as far as I was concerned. It was really strange, you know, there's this real conversation about like mainstream and like what was cool, and I was like, the internet, everything that's on the internet is mainstream. I'm not putting my party on that. Um, however, I was then kind of hit on by the ad man, I'd say about 24 years old, because they were like, damn, there's this girl making this stuff, and she gets the group, and she can... <laughs> basically run a campaign for us. So what happened was I launched a label when I was like 25 and I was like the editor and the art director um, for Adidas and Stella McCartney. And it was really interesting to talk about visibility because I'd say it was the very first, uh, now it's just called like influencer marketing, where you have someone like semi-fabulous basically make something or pretend to make something. The fact was, at that point, I was really furious. I was throwing this party with people not realising it was me doing it because effectively it meant I could spy on people better. I was then infuriated that I had to be visible on this campaign because I knew that immediately my face next to it would devalue all of the hard work that I was going to do on it. Long story short, it didn't work and I was paid. It was great. <laughs> um, I, I, but, it, but really, like, it was something that I really, really thought of. I was like, the moment my face is on this, it, 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 no one's going to realise I've shot the damn thing, written the damn thing, cast the damn thing. The next bit of visibility I want to talk about in that campaign, and particularly in advertising structure, uh, is um, kind of faces that you see. So I, because of this clubbing thing, I used to then do pop videos and casting, blah, blah, blah. Um, I found out, two years after I, I did this campaign went for two years, I was on this retainer, it was really great. Did, well, it wasn't really great, I hated it, but I did the job. Uh, I then uh, started doing work for other kind of giant brands. And it was a kind of a case of like one big, one small, one fat, one thin, one brown, one yellow, one, I mean, it's like the worst when you get into these meetings. And uh, it, it's so unbelievably offensive. Um, but what you see, what you saw is, you know, it's like there's a little conversation like, like the pink pound and all these things. It's the, the market, the marketers and the advertisers realising that there are these markets. And the, at the moment that they put someone who looks like me on it, a girl who looks like me is going to come and buy it. 
Um, now, I was really infuriated, but I then found out, kind of, I mean, it wasn't all so terrible, because I found out two years later that, say, with the Adidas campaign I'd done, so this is a global campaign. So the way that it works is you, you get your sectors and they get kind of like boxed up into bits. So you'll have like a huge activation, huge advert will go up directly to the UK market. Then what you'll get is mini versions of that rolled out across the world, across Europe, with again someone who relates to that audience. Um, glo essentially, we had, I was running a magazine, we had a cover girl for every month. I would say 90% of those girls being athletes were black. Um, all the young athletes coming through. I found out that many years later Adidas had to make this decision because essentially the black people on Russian television to boycott that entire market. And that's when I really took it seriously and I was like, wow, actually this is really serious. Like, it's really, really important. And it's not, they're not all evil. The head men aren't totally evil. But it was it's pretty wild. Um, the next thing that then happened after I did all that was, uh, so I started making, I spent two years, uh, everything, I, just, I saved up all the money, put it into a studio and just twiddled my thumbs and did lots of work. Um, that, I naturally then kind of started falling onto arts calendars, particularly uh, events calendars, performance calendars. I'd stopped throwing my party max at them because people started taking pictures of it. And at that point, what you have is the destruction of the scene. What you have is, it's like, the, it's like 2015, it's like the influx of like, shot the look, of like, hashtag I'm here, like, you know, like, you know, that, like, whatever that is. Like, I, I really hated that. And I was really proud that we made this party, that when you walked in, every inch of it was the most photogenic thing, as far as I was concerned, I'd ever seen, of like, weird black power posters, like scrawled handwriting. I mean, it was just absolutely gorgeous, but no one took a damn picture. But then you've got, you know, like all the magazines start writing about it, and it's, oh, we've got to turn up, kill it now. So <laughs> killed kill that, but couldn't resolve why I was so fascinated with staring at people. Then you've also got to put in the mix that I've been on shoots for years. So I'm that, per I was the art director on the shoots, never shooting, which is a nice, topic conversation about like who owns the rights of your images. I figured that out pretty quickly and I was like, if I don't take the damn picture, I've set up the thing and commit to bloody X, Y, Z, name shame, but I was like, oh God, I'd rather just learn how to take it myself. But um, so what I, what I did was I was invited to this arts programme and um, <coughs> visibility and framing. So I couldn't decide, I couldn't figure out why I was so fascinated watching the people and etc, uh, etc. Et so I, I set up two coloramas in a space. So coloramas are those things you normally like roll them down and then you take a picture on. That kind of looks like that. One was going to be moving image and one was going to be stills. We invited everybody to come and play their favourite song and dance to it and we're going to film them. Simple as anything. Uh, halfway through the night we realised it just wasn't working. Um, we tore down one colorama, pulled the whole thing back and then we filmed, you could see everything. I mean, it's quite trendy now. My friend Tara made it pretty trendy to like basically put a colorama up and then you move back and you actually show everything that's outside the frame. Um, we kind of did it in film and it became this big video installation that again, you can all stand around. Um, but ultimately, I mean, the thing that I think is the most interesting thing is we spend all our time like looking at looking at, looking at screens and, and and frames and 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 what's visible and what's not in it and I think that's really the most interesting thing. I just found I found myself just recently having an entire relationship on FaceTime. I realised that this girl she knew everything about me within the frame and so did I. Because then when we saw each other in real life, it was a complete pile of shit. It wasn't real in any sense. And it's really fascinating being on this panel because you all come from incredibly I would say like intellectually politicised background, my mind is fully advertising, fully fashion and fully, so I don't believe in photography, it's all fake. <laughs> it's none of it's real. You can't, you can show me anything and I know, I know it's fake. I've, sh I've shown, you know, because I'm, I, I'm hired to edit it, I'm hired to pull it in, I'm hired to like pull your ears up and then, or I'm hired even worse to get something out of you you don't know that's there. Um, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, the last thing I want to say about visibility, um, 
it's really, it, 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 it's really I, I again started really, really realising how important it was that I actually ultimately was seen to be doing what I was doing. Because I'd be doing these talks and these wonderful young girls come and see me and they're going, oh my God, I can be like you. And I'm like, well, hell yeah. But it just hadn't occurred to me that they needed to see someone that looked like me. It's as simple as. Or my little sister could turn around and go, you know that girl you put in the ASOS commercial? She looked just like me. Why didn't you put me in it? It's like, oh, okay, like this is actually really, really important. Like, I can't just be kind of so, you know, but there is something that happens when you are in those rooms and you're being told to kind of pick one of, you know, this strange picking thing. Um, in terms of like the people that I hear are in my work, I certainly fall in love with certain people and you'll see them reoccurring. Um, I mean, I'm interested in like whoever you actually are, which is really difficult because what we have is like an entire generation of photo face. Um, it's really difficult now if you pull the camera out, everybody knows exactly, well like if you're like, I don't know, under 30, you've got a pretty good idea of what you want to be seen as and what you want to be shelved next to. So it's really, you kind of learn these different ways of tricking people. But again, that goes back into what I'm saying, like I don't believe it's, none of it's real, it's all trickery. It's all kind of smoke and mirrors. But that, I mean, it's odd me saying that, it's almost like outing myself because of, like, I get so, so the, the, the work is often that I may describe as incredibly authentic. Um, but I mean, I don't know if it really is. I'm feeling really pessimistic too now. <laughs> um, but more and more, I'm very interested in like screenshot culture. I think some of my best photography is made that way. I also consider photography, I don't really consider, I consider like graphics and balance. You know, like I don't really see these as like photos, I see them as like shapes and I can talk about it. it's like the golden, you know, I can see like what works and what doesn't. It was interesting that I was making print before I was taking, well, I mean you're always taking photo, well, I was very lucky to always have been taking photos, but my main thing was layouts, making club posters and how easily that then translated into uh, f f f image making and then film making and like particularly like thinking about yeah about balance and where things sit. Uh, I'm trying to think what else might be interesting. If anyone have any question, by the way, mm -hmm. jump and shoot. <laughs> Super different from what everyone else was talking about. <laughs> How's How's the how is the fact that everyone has a camera? Well, how is it that? A lot of young people now use cameras all the time. Mm -hmm. Change your job and, you, and, and advertising. Well, I don't. I don't work in advertising. It was interesting. I had to give a trend forecasting talk back to Adidas a week ago, and they were like, "Would you ever do it again?" And I was like, "Yeah, if I was the boss, because like I'm not here to be like sat talking to you guys, going you need to be on Tumblr or in Westfield Shopping Centre at 4 p.m. on a Tuesday to talk to a teenage girl. You know, like wake up." <laughs> but it's it's. it's I don't know. It's, I don't know if that does that answer the question. It's, it, I've, I don't think I could do it. I mean, maybe I could do it. I don't know. It's so depressing. No one needs anything. No one needs any more stuff, ultimately. <laughs> it's the bottom line there. I think they should all stop. I was saying that I think, I, think, I think the most disruptive and brilliant thing that any advertiser can do at this point is actually to completely restrict the number of images they make. I am disgusted by how many pictures I take, how many, like, I spent all day at the march filming. Yeah. Kim and I was coming here, I was looking at all of it, and I mean, I was just walking around like this. I, I, Jenny, I just wasn't even, wasn't even thinking. And so was everybody else. I mean, there was seven, something like um, 70,000 people. 700,000 people. Seven hundred thousand people. And everybody had their cameras out. Everybody had their cameras out and filming. And if you're thinking, all those images, with all their different choices of that march and all their different perceptions. That's true. Really, that's, that's true. true. What's, what's true? What's true? I don't really know, actually. <laughs> I'm actually quite looking forward to go back onto Facebook later on because I didn't make it there myself. But I know like maybe 500 people that were there today, and they're all like Facebook friends. And I just want to go back and look at the pictures and see what everyone's created from it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, it's really interesting. But again, it's, it's whoever's taking it. That was the thing that I, I learned the most from doing dance therapy. And I showed this work, I've shown it maybe four times now. Every time we showed it, I made a new edit. Every time I re-edited it, I re-watched the footage and I found a new story. I mean, that is certainly symptomatic of my personal issues with boredom. I am very distracted. We consider ourselves like part of generation distraction, distracted. Like, but it, I then realized at that point, like it's like Big Brother, every time I was going to re-edit it, I could tell an entirely new story. I was going to focus on Wilson hitting on Tiger, or I was going to focus on Trent. So I was going to focus on Faye and how Faye is completely obsessed with being known and visible and famous in front, but she's also gorgeous. It's like, you know, there's, there's all these things, I think, it's not as simple just as like the way someone looks. Maybe that's a really that's that's what I want to end on. It's just not as simple as that. I found that I think that's why I found the casting thing so difficult. Like what I wanted to know were per personality traits rather than visuals. However, it's really important to see people that look like you. <laughs> and I do it. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Don't have a question. So to to you say to talk to his faith, but is it democratic? I don't know what that question means. I've sat here now for an hour and I just don't know what that means. I personally, I, I just, it doesn't, that question doesn't make any sense to me, particularly as I consider, like, exactly as, as, as you were saying, the huge privilege that I have of having access to an iPhone, potentially being given a fucking Google Pixel. Not everyone is. It's really as simple as that. It's, I think drawing is more democratic than your mouth is, actually. Um, that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to move a kind of general thank you and then we're going to move on to open conversation. So thanks for incredible French team to um, encourage us to create this event and thanks greatly, uh, incredible panel of contributors to the discussion today. And thanks for Brewdog Party Beer for supporting us <laughs> and Phoenix for this grand space. And thanks to all the artists whose work has surrounded us during this illuminating conversation, evidencing the scope of photography's potential. So I'm reading this, but I'm after this all tour, I'm not really sure I should say that. <laughs> um, now, if any have anyone have any questions? Like, I was kind of like homeless, living on the street, and then there was um, someone said, why don't you go and do a six-week photography course? So I thought, okay, I'll go and do this course, trying to see if I can get into it or not. Then next time I'm going to say, there you go, there's this basal well, camera, go and take your pictures. Then next time I'm going to go, the council table and go, it's for the publicity that created. Like, we can't have you living in a shop doorway anymore, there's, there's the keys to a studio flat. So I'm thinking, what? So that got me that happened, and it took two and a half years for something to actually happen to actually give me a set of keys. And then I'll take that and look at that now. And I'm, the only pictures I'm going to take now are really still life pictures. And I just want to work on a series of just like ponds and trees. And, and I just want to try and work and try and develop. Where I'm just trying to get to. But then how can I actually express that? And sort of like, it takes, it takes something like taking a picture to change your life. And I just can't really say how that, how, I can see the concept of it. But then I want to now go and to learn more about it and try and get on an even platform with it, whether that's it's balanced, it's not all over the place. I believe in just making constantly. I think you should just shoot constantly. You shoot constantly. Con 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 constantly. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But you should sit and think about it. You should just, you know. Yeah, when you come here, when you come here, I get it. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> from, from, from right now, like, next Friday, just click. Everything in here, just click it. Just click it. Just click it. Just click it. And then from right on, we're going to blog at the end of it. I mean, it's a, it's a good example of a, a positive thing that photography can do. And, you know, at a time when Trump's basically saying, beat up journalists, you know, we need to, I think, defend the freedom of the press um, with all our energy and all our activism. Um, because it's a scary thing when journalists can't go and do their work and when they're afraid of their lives, as we've seen mm. today, you know, that you are actually putting your life on 
on the line if you're if you're uh, you know photographing, and we have we know this. It's 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 something that we've seen in all this century, but we get to a point where we think that those things have changed and that it's more democratic, but actually it seems to be quite a scary time now in which we have to reassess the history. Um, in, and I'm trying to remember which year it was, I think it was 2008, Brighton Photo Biennial was curated by Julian Stalbras and it had um, an incredible range of wolf trophy um, in it, including Thomas Herschel's incredibly visceral um, sculpture or installation, whatever you want to call it, but it was basically a whole wall of body parts um, at Fabrica, and it was horrific to look at. Um, it was the it was the effects of all in in all its gory detail, and and it seemed like an end point really in in art photography of like how you represent the horror. Um, and it was hard to know where you, you know where you go from there. But I think that you know, it's it, I think it, it's interesting that I don't know. It's, it's such a massive subject, isn't it? Yes. Um, just sort of following on from that, um, do you or your opinion on um, is there a responsibility as people who are receptors to images? What like? Is there, can we have, should we have a responsibility to receiving images in how we receive them? I don't know if that makes sense. Like, so, yeah, what is our responsibility? Is there, should there be a, con a responsibility in consuming images today? Has it changed? I don't know if that's too broad, but... What do you mean a responsibility? So, in terms of, say, advertising images, yeah. as consumers, should we be responding? Is there a responsibility to respond or think critically? Or in photojournalist images, what is the responsibility? I just think it's amazing if anyone reacts to anything at the moment because you see too much. <laughs> My eyes are completely asleep. It's, it's like, it's so difficult. It, 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 just. Like the tube, the bus, the phone, the emails, the, the, the just constant. I think if you can have any reaction, how how wonderful. I'm not, I'm not completely convinced by this, because I mean, it's an interesting, this thing of democracy is often related to this thing that there are too many images, and that, that one is undermining the other. But I mean, you know, it's something people have said about photography pretty much from the moment it was invented, all the way through its history. At different points, people have said, oh, there are too many images, I can't understand them, you know, they're, they're kind of, in some cases people are saying they're literally making me, wow, well, that's really kicking off outside. Uh, agreement, hopefully, is the point I'm trying to make. Um, you know, people are saying they're kind of, they literally can't understand what they're looking at because there are so many photographs. People have been saying this since the 1840s. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I think there is a responsibility, I think that in some ways is a get out that people use to say, I'm not going to take responsibility for the way I engage with images because there are too many of them, I'm just going to... And I think actually, you know, we do have a kind of responsibility. The trouble is, realistically, most people aren't going to do that. They're not going to take the time to educate themselves about how images are made and how they're circulated. They I mean, don't care. They don't care, probably, and even once you do, you just don't have the time. I mean, it's my job, and I barely have the time to do it. So, you know, it's, it's difficult. Unless, I think it's like one of these things like putting labelling on something. You know, unless you kind of mandate that all, I don't know, newspapers have to label their images so you know where they've come from or how they're produced or something like that, it just isn't going to happen. And they're probably not going to do that, so. 